morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Thank you, online students, for uh, joining us. Welcome to our e-learning students as well and to our in-person students. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask one of you to lead us in prayer, please? Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this new day and this time you have given us to learn your word, Lord. Father, we are so thankful to you, Lord. Father, we submit each one of us unto your loving hands, Lord. Father, we pray that, Holy Spirit, Lord, you open our eyes and minds and our understanding that we may be transformed by your word and be a blessing for everyone around us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, uh, Nina Santosh. So last week we began studying um, Romans chapter eight. Okay, so verses one and two, we looked at that. Uh, Romans chapter eight is one of the most uh, powerful chapters in the Bible with profound truths. Uh, it's one of my favorite chapters as well. How many of your favorite chapter is Romans? One of the favorite chapters is Romans chapter eight. Anyone? Okay. Anyone else? Online students? Anyone's favorite? Okay, Nina, John as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, uh, continue from um, verse 3. Okay, but uh, somebody can read uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Amen. So in um, uh, verse 2, Paul is giving the answer to the struggle that he has presented in Romans chapter 7. Okay. So where he says, you know, in verse Romans chapter 7, hey, my, I'm controlled by the law of sin, the power, the dominion of sin in my body. And verse 2 of chapter 8, he's presenting the answer. So what is the answer? Paul says, the Holy Spirit sets me free from the control of sin and death. What sin is producing in me, the Holy Spirit sets me free. Okay. So for all of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Okay. He's spoken that in chapter verse 1. And he says, we are able to walk in accordance with the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit liberates us and sets us free completely from the control of sin well, and the, the result of sin, which is death, okay? And verse 3, Paul is saying that the law couldn't help him to overcome the flesh, okay? Yes, the law told him what is right and wrong, but it did not give him the power to overcome the weakness of the flesh. So what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now you need to remember the words very carefully here. Paul is writing, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He does not say God sent his son in the sinful flesh, which means he is not saying that, you know, Jesus was as sinful as we are, but in the likeness of sinful flesh means he was human in every way, just like we are, yet without sin. So when Jesus was on this earth, he was fully man, 100% man. Okay, uh, He lived in the fullness of humanity, but yet one thing was not common with him and us is that he was not born in sin or he had no sinful nature in him like us. Okay, So he says God did uh, uh, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. And what did Jesus do in his body? He condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in his flesh. So the, the phrase in the likeness of sinful flesh, okay, his body could have been subjected to fleshly desires, 
just like you and I have been, but we know that he did not submit to the sinful desires of the flesh. Okay? He could have, but he did not. Do you think Jesus was tempted? Just once or more than once? Yes, more than once. But he did not yield to sin. Okay? So what is Jesus trying to tell us by becoming human? Is one of the things is, hey, you know, look at me. Even though I was fully human, I was tempted. I could have yielded to the sinful desires of my flesh, yielded to the temptation, but I did not. So Jesus is a model for us even in that sense. So he came in the same body that you and I have that could have been subjected to the fleshly desires, but we know that the Son of God did not submit to any of the fleshly desires. He never sinned. Okay, But he condemned sin in the flesh. Very powerful, right? It means Jesus subdued, he overcame, he deprived sin of its power, which means that we also can overcome, we can also deprive sin of its power that is working against us in the members of our body. Okay, So in his own body, he deprived sin of its power power. Sin had no power over him, right? Just like Paul says in, in chapter 6, chapter 7, the power of sin is broken, you know. Uh, we are no longer uh, under the power of sin, dominion of sin. We are no longer slaves of sin, but we are slaves of righteousness, chapter 7, okay? So here he's saying that, you know, um, uh, he, uh, when he, when Jesus, um, you know, uh, broke the power of sin in his body, you know, he won the victory and he shares that victory with us, right? So everything that Jesus has won victory on the cross, he shares his victory with us. Why? How do we know that he shares his victory with us? Hebrews says that he is the captain of our salvation. So if a captain goes forward and wins the battle against the enemy, the whole army wins, right? When David won the battle against Goliath. It's only David and Goliath uh, fighting the battle, but it was like the whole army of Israelites won the battle. So there was, there have been some wars in history where only the two kings come and fight and whoever wins, you know, the, the country or the, the, the army wins. It's not necessary for the whole army to win. So Jesus likewise is the captain of our salvation and when he won the victory on the cross he shares the victory with each one of us amen okay so the victory is also ours that means we are also considered as people who have uh, you know who, uh, who have been dead to sin and the power of sin is no longer operative in our lives did we read verse 4 as well we read verse 4 as well, right? I think you read verse 4. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So verse 4 says that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirits. Okay. So the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay. So Christ did the work on the cross. He purchased our righteousness. It is his righteousness that has been imputed or been put upon us or into our account. And what are we to do? We just have to walk in what he has already finished on the cross or won for us on the cross. He condemned sin in his body so that we will be able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. How will we be able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law? When we don't walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit so paul is saying this is god's answer to our problem what he has presented chapter 5 6 7 saying this is the answer the answer is how will you overcome the 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 deeds of the flesh don't give in to the flesh don't walk according to the flesh but walk according to the spirit now when we walk according to the spirit we fulfill the righteous requirements of the Law. So Paul's struggle in Romans chapter 7, which he presents to us, finds the solution in Romans chapter 8, where he's presenting the solution. So the answer, what is the answer? What is the solution? He's saying walk according to the spirit. Why? Because the spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. 
Law of sin and death means the power, the control, the dominion of sin and death. So when we walk in the spirit or the spirit sets us free from the control, the dominion of sin and death. Now, how do we walk according to the spirit? And that is what he goes on to teach us here. To walk according to the spirit, we need to be spiritually minded, right? Paul mentions also in Galatians chapter 5, walk according to the Spirit. He, he mentions the list of the uh, fruits of the spirit and the fruits of the flesh. Okay. So he says here that, you know, walk according to the spirit. What does it mean? It means to be spiritually minded. Okay. You shouldn't be carnally minded. You have to be spiritually minded. And uh, it when we do that, it places before us, you know, uh, choices that we have to make, either spiritual or carnal so there is every time we are faced with choices you know whether we give in to our you know choose what is spiritual or choose what is carnal okay but for us to be walking in the spirit we will be able to choose what is spiritually minded spiritually inclined and what is spiritually um, uh, required of us to do okay so that was verses one two four i explained one uh, two and three last week i just went through three and uh, also explained verse four now we'll move on so can somebody read uh, verse five please for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit amen so he's saying set their minds, those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit have to set their minds on the things of the spirit. Okay. So here he says set their minds on things of the flesh. Means a person who's seeking after or a person who's pursuing after the things of the flesh. Who is the one person who set their minds on things of the flesh? The person who is seeking after or pursuing after the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. Okay. So here is a key. How do I live and walk according to the spirit? Or how do I live in my life in subjection or alignment to the Holy Spirit? How do we do that? It says set your mind or set your seeking, your thinking, your pursuing, your affections, your desires have to be set on the things of the spirit. Okay. So how do you live in subjection or in alignment to the Holy Spirit? You have to set your mind. That means you have to seek, you have to think, you have to pursue. Your affections, your desires should be all set on the things of the spirit. Things of the spirit means what God desires, what God has spoken of in his word. Now, when we need, when we make the shift, remember this is a shift, right? Because when we were living in our sinful nature, before we were born again, we were gratifying the desires of our carnal nature, of our flesh. We were setting our minds on everything that was of the flesh. We were seeking and pursuing that. But we need to make a shift, right? It is a shift. And it is something that we need to work hard. We deliberately have to think about and we have to work on. Okay. And in Romans chapter 12, you know, Paul comes back to make the same point. Now we are looking, having a forward view, right? So Romans chapter 12, he comes back to the same point where he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay. So there also he talks about the renewing of the mind so our minds need to be changed our minds have to come to a place where we are making that co conscious shift we are practicing that shift shifting from thinking in carnal nature to thinking spiritually minded to be spiritually minded okay so your mind needs to be changed to think of spiritual things okay so practically how we set our minds on the things of the spirit? How do we set our minds on the things of the spirit practically? Okay. We need to think aligned to the word of 
God every day in our life, right? Um, and it's an ongoing process, right? Now, for example, you're going to work. Okay, you have a job, you're going to work. Or, uh, you know, um, there are many reasons why somebody goes to work. What is the basic reason why somebody works? To earn money, yes. To earn money to take care of our basic necessities, okay? Now, people also work because they want to grow professionally. They want to enhance their skills. Now, when a person is going to work, a carnal-minded person can think, hey, I need to overtake others. I'll do anything. Whether it's even, you know, moral values, standards, ethical value standards, doesn't matter. I want to come to that role of a manager. I want to grow up the ladder. I want to get a promotion. I will do anything and everything. And it is so sad nowadays in the corporate life that many of them compromise on their moral standards just to grow up that or walk up that ladder. Okay. And there are no people who call it out because everybody is doing it. And if you call it out, what happens? You are really in a, in a fix. I, my sister works in the corporate and she's extremely a bold person. I think she should have become a judge and an advocate, you know, but she's extremely bold. She will just call it things out. If it is unethical, it's immoral, it's wrong, she will just call it out and she will not bother whether she's going to lose her job, she's not going to grow up the corporate ladder or whether she's going to not get her perks or she's not even losing out on her um, promotion or, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, even her pay scale rising, she's not bothered. And she's so bold because no one can touch her with her job. She's extremely good at it, but she just calls it out. And it just shakes people. The people are really scared at, in her workplace with her and what they say, what they do and how they live their lives. And uh, she is as bold as that. And she just speaks you know, and, and she just can speak. But that is, you know, her, her thing is, you know, you go to the workplace not to earn just money, not to just grow in your professional skills, to grow up the ladder, to get a promotion, but to do what is honoring in God's sight, to extend God's kingdom there. Now, when a spiritually minded person goes to job, how do they think? They think, hey, I want to glorify God through my work. I want to see how I can influence lives for the kingdom of God. I want to see, you know, that wherever, uh, whatever I'm doing can uh, bring meaning and can bear fruit for God's kingdom. Even that I can release God's kingdom culture, kingdom thinking, kingdom morality, kingdom ethics, kingdom values. I want to do that. And that is what God has called us to be. He's called us to be priests in that workplace. Now, the question is, all of you are students here, right? In-person students. Now, how do you approach your classes? I have to go to class. I have to sit through those lectures. I have to get a degree. Then I'll do whatever I want after that, whether it's ministry or not. Or you're saying, hey, I'm coming to learn about God's word, to be equipped, to thoroughly be equipped, to be uh, deeply, strongly rooted in the found uh, doctrines, in the word of God, so that I can go and preach and teach to my church or to my people who do not know these important, valuable truths. So what is your mindset? Just to come and get a degree or just because you have to sit through the lecture, you get a degree so you can get a job so that you can move on, you can get married, you have children and you have some earning or doing something for the kingdom of God. You know, learning so that you can, you know, pursue the call of God and be useful and, you know, uh, be thoroughly equipped so that you can, you know, um, uh, preach and teach the word of God. Okay. So, uh, what is your mindset? That is very, very uh, important. So when a spiritually minded person is doing things to further God's kingdom, to pursue God's kingdom, he's seeking, thinking, pursuing and setting his affections on the things of his spirit on his daily routine or everyday work. Okay. Every day we do a lot of things. We need to ask ourselves, hey, why am I doing what I am doing? Is this honoring God? Am I doing with 
you know, am I serving God with my passion, with doing my best with excellence? So even when I'm coming to teach in Bible college, I'm constantly asking myself, hey, am I just sticking to the notes? Am I reading more? I am getting more knowledge so that I can give more information. Am I spending time and going through this so that I can teach well, so that I can do things with excellence? You know, so that, you know, students are benefited, so that the kingdom of God is enriched. So we need to ask ourselves, why am I doing what I am doing? Just because of the sake of doing, or how can I see this as something that is pursuing, you know, uh, furthering, uh, or seeking or thinking and setting my affections and desires on things of the spirit, okay? So when we do that, we are living and walking according to the spirit. Are you able to understand? Yes. So at the workplace, you know, when a spiritually minded people person sees people doing things or trying to do things, you know, to get to the top ladder or trying to pull others down, uh, try, trying to backbite, stab other people, this person is not hassled because he knows that God is the promoter. He's not somebody saying, okay, let me also do that so that I can climb up the ladder. Let me give up my moral standards and my ethical standards so that I can do a little cheating here and there so that I can, you know, uh, be po you know, get a, a promotion or get a pay hike, whatever. But he's or she is not hassled by what is going around them. Yes, they're doing their work well. They're being excellent. That is very, very important. Their mind is not fixed on do out doing other people so that they can get their position, but their mind is on God. Saying, God, I want to be, do things with excellence, with integrity, with honesty, putting in hard work in those, you know, whatever, eight hours, nine hours of work, you know, and I want to glorify your kingdom. Okay, I want to glorify you so that you can be glorified. And when we do that, you know, God is the one who can give us glory, honor, and name comes from God himself. And God opens the door, no man can shut. So this person who is spiritually minded is not affected by the things that happen in his workplace. He's living according to the spirit. Okay. He's not worried about what he or she is not worried about what the people are doing behind them, in front of them, not retaliating, but just walking in love, joy, and peace because he set his mind or set their minds on the things of the spirit and they're walking according to the spirit okay so now you understand what is the meaning of walking according to the spirit right fully yielded submitted in submission uh, to the holy spirit and it is to be spiritually minded it is thinking according to the ways and the thoughts of god according to his word okay verse six can somebody read verse six for to be Certainly, carnally, mind, carnally minded in death is death, is that but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Yes, so here he's making a contrast. This is what he's telling the believer if you are carnally minded, what is the outcome? Death. Yes, there's no two ways about it. If you're spiritually minded, what is the outcome? Life and peace. Peace even in the midst of storms, in the midst of turmoil, challenges, difficulties, you will have the peace. Verse 7, can somebody read that? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor uh, indeed can be. Yes. So Paul is telling the believer, if you have a carnal mind, there is going to be death that is working in you. Okay, that means what? Corruption, decay, sickness, oppression, depression, everything else. Okay, and also when you are carnally minded, you are enemy of God, enemy, uh, you have enmity with God, and you are also not subject to the law of God, to the dominion, the power of God. Okay, verse 8. Those who are in the realm of flesh cannot please God. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Thank you. So these are strong words, you know. A parallel scripture that we can look at is James chapter 4, verse 4. Okay, can somebody read that? James chapter 4, verse 4. 
James chapter 4 verse 4 Can you please read from NKJV yeah thank you Adulterers adulterers and adulterers do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God however therefore whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of the God Amen. He uses strong words here, right? Adulteress and adulterers. You know, you know, if you are friendship with the world, you are enmity with God. Okay. So the same thing he's also talking here. So he's saying if you're walking in a carnal mind, you are enemy of God. You cannot do what is right and you cannot be subject to the law of God. God. Law of God means not the Old Testament law. It yes, it talks about power, dominion, and the authority of the uh, power of God. And you cannot please God. Okay. So when we do that, it does not mean that God disowns us. Okay. Um, nor will God tell you, "Hey, I don't like you. I hate you." No, He won't say that. God cannot hate anybody. God is love. That is His very core of His nature, His attributes, who He is. Okay, so, but, you know, in Christ, God loves us. He is merciful uh, to us and he loves us and he accepts us. But if we live life pleasing in our carnal nature, that is working in us. Even though God still loves us, even though God is still merciful and gracious and compassionate and forgiving, he cannot change. That is who he is. But if we are living in the carnal nature, that is still working in us. Okay. So when we are enemies of God, we are going away from the way of God. We're not choosing God's ways, but we are going in our own ways. And that is going to lead into eternal hell and destruction. But if we are spiritually minded, we are taking on the ways of God. God. So when he's talking about Rome in Romans chapter 12, a renewed mind, what is a renewed mind? God says in Isaiah, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts, your thoughts. So what is a renewed mind? A renewed mind is basically taking on the ways and the thoughts of God. And how do you take on the ways and the thoughts of God? Reading the word of God. Okay. So now uh, Paul has already mentioned to us the provisions that God has already made for us. He's already spoken about the truth of our identification in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now, so why is it when God has made all of these provisions for us, and the truth of our identification that so many believers are still living such defeated lives. Why is still death working in their lives, in a believer's life? Why is still death working in them? Why is it that they are going in the opposite direction from what God wants them to go in? And why is it that they're still living lives that do not please God? I'm talking about believers. Why? Okay, they did not choose to submit to the Holy Spirit. The answer is still they are carnal minded. They are setting their mind on pleasing and satisfying the evil desires of the flesh and the body and the soul. That is being carnally minded. And so this is very important uh, for us and for a believer to know that if you want to bear fruit, good fruit, you know, if you want to... Uh, you know, overcome sin, if you want to stop the power of death and sin working in your body, you have to walk according to the spirit. You have to set your mind on things of the spirit. You have to be spiritually minded. Okay. So we need to ask ourselves frequently, are we thinking, desiring, pursuing the things of the spirit? Or am I thinking, desiring, pursuing the things of the flesh? So when you're making a decision, when you are trying to react to something, when you want to do something, you're making a choice. This is a question that we need to ask ourselves. So the believer is, uh, the believer's life is thinking, desiring, and pursuing the things of the spirit. You know, Paul is saying that the believer will enjoy a life of 
peace, right? And he will also be friends with God and will also please God. So if you're looking at your life and saying, hey, there is no peace, there's no peace in my home, there's no peace in my marriage, there's no peace in my life, there's no peace anywhere I go, you need to ask yourself, hey, are you carnally minded? Are you pursuing, desiring the things of the flesh? Okay. So in one hand, you know, uh, we can be with at peace with God. We have accepted God. We can have a right standing with God, you know, right standing in his grace, eternal life. We have the right standing or we have the righteousness of God imputed to us. Everything that Paul has spoken about from chapter 1 right up to chapter 7. Remember, he says, we are accepted with God. We have the right standing in grace. We have the right standing um, uh, in truth. The truth of our identification, our eternal life, the righteousness. All of these, yes, are wonderful things. These are all spiritual truths of our identification of what is our standing in God that we have read or looked at or what Paul has elaborated for us from chapter 1 right up to chapter 7. But in our practical life, if you are continuing to be carnal minded, we can have a different position and a stand. But if you are uh, you know, uh, pursuing the things of the carnal mind, if I am focused on seeking and desiring and pleasing the desires of the flesh, then there is no use of the truth of our identification or our standing in God. Okay, So we need to get ourselves and we need to get other believers from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. Okay, and There's all the things that God has done for us, his wonderful promises, his blessings, everything will just remain in the Bible, okay, and there won't be an experience for us. And the person or believer cannot experience everything that God has done for us and provided for us on the cross. Any questions so far? Any doubts, any questions? No? So sometimes believers, they won't be knowing about this. See how much ever we say also, it won't, I mean, so how can we help us and them like, you know, to understand this truth? Yes, very good question. How do we, uh, we are trying to tell them they're not able to listen. Because that's why Jesus said, you know, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be seeing, but never perceiving. Okay. Because their hearts are so dull. So it's the work of the Holy Spirit. So you need to pray for them. You know, the more you soak them in prayer and pray and ask God to show them and open their eyes and their ears, remove the heart of stone, give them a heart of flesh, the hardness of their heart so that they can see it's only the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then the Holy Spirit only can encounter them. So they can have encounters with God, which then they can realize the truth. Yes. So God should prepare the heart, so Holy Spirit can prepare the heart so that it will be like the good soil that the seed can fall on. Either it is a, a, a heart of rocks or thorns, you know, there won't be any use, right? Yeah. Verse 9, can somebody read that? Uh, verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So Paul is telling the believers, uh, thank you. Paul is telling the believers, you are not to be living according to the flesh, but the spirit. Why? Because the spirit of God dwells in us. When we are born again, the spirit of God dwells in us. And because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we have no excuse to live in the flesh. Okay, there is no excuse. We can't say, hey, I cannot overcome my flesh. I cannot overcome the temptation. I cannot overcome this. I cannot overcome that. No, we have no excuse to live in the flesh because we are already living in the spirit. Okay, and so here he says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So this is the life of the believer. The life of the believer is what they are in the spirit. It means living out of the spirit. 
Okay. A nice analogy that we can think of is a fish. A fish is living in water. Its life is where? In the water. If it's, you know, the moment you take the fish out of its environment, what happens to fish? Yes, the life, there's no longer life in that fish because its life comes from the water. Likewise, as believers, we need to know that our life is in the spirit. Okay. And if you're not living in the spirit, if you're not walking according to the spirit, if you're not spiritually minded, then there is no life, right? So how is this possible? How can we live in the spirit? How can we walk in the spirit? It's possible by the Holy Spirit who is living in us. That is why God says in Exodus chapter 32, says that I will remove from you a heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon your heart and your mind and my spirit will cause you to keep all of my laws and my commandments. Okay, so that is what he promised and that is what we see in fulfillment in the New Testament and even today. So my life is coming from where? From the spirit and I have to walk according to the spirit. Verse 10, can somebody read that? And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Amen. Thank you. So in verse 9, he says, the spirit of Christ is in you. And verse 10, he says, Christ is in you. Right? So here we see a new title for the Holy Spirit. What is the title for the Holy Spirit? He's called as the Spirit of Christ. What does it mean? What does it mean? Jesus himself, okay? As Jesus lived, we also have to live, okay? It means that all who Christ is to us, the Holy Spirit is to you and me. That is why when we also take communion, we say, Father, you know, we pray that the Holy Spirit will make available the full benefits of the cross. We pray that the Holy Spirit will make available to us everything that Jesus has already provided for us on the cross. Okay, So all who Christ is to us, the Holy Spirit is to you and me. That means the Holy Spirit brings Jesus to you and to me. Okay. So verse 10, he says, Christ is in you. How is Christ in you and me? Yes, by his spirit. Okay. Christ is in you. But the spirit, uh, but he says, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay. So in my spirit, what does it mean? But the spirit is life because of righteousness. What does it mean? He says, in my spirit, I have received righteousness right therefore i have the life of the spirit from the holy spirit how do we have the life of the holy spirit it's because we have been made righteous not by anything that we have done but because of what christ has done on the cross christ's righteousness has been put into our account like is somebody putting money into your account and you're able to use it right so it's christ's righteousness that has been imputed credited into our account and that is his righteousness has been put into our spirit man therefore i have life in my spirit from the holy spirit verse 11 can somebody read that powerful verse verse 11 but if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen. This is one of the most powerful verses in the scripture. One of the most powerful verses. I don't know if you, uh, when I read it long, way long time back, it was just so powerful for me. And I just declare this because it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus back from death to life, if the same spirit dwells in you, he who raised Christ back from the dead will also 
give life to your mortal bodies. That means he will quicken life in your mortal bodies to the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So anytime you are sick, you are unwell, you are praying for anyone who is sick, unwell, the situation is really bad, Speak the scripture verse. It is so powerful. Speak it over your life every day. You know, I remember when we were in the COVID time, one of our church members um, was really in a very bad situation. He was, you know, his health was deteriorating really bad. And um, uh, he was, he, he, he testified to this in, in, at APC Central. He was saying he was in Baptist Hospital. That day his condition was really bad in the morning. He had all, I think, 11 doctors, he said, was around him. And he knew his situation is really bad. And they were all talking about sending him to Velour because there was, that's about what they could do to him. That's when Pastor Ashish sent him Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He's saying the first time I have read this verse in my life, he said, when I read that, it was just so powerful. He said, I don't know, I've never read this, but this verse was so powerful. He just believed it all of his heart. And he's saying that in just moment of minutes, everything, his vitals, everything, his, you know, his, um, uh, all of his, uh, you know, his reports, everything started changing. And, um, you know, he got out of the hospital well. And when he went back for a checkup, you know, the doctors looked at him and said, you are just a miracle. But he's saying this worse quicken life in his mortal body. He says he changed things. He changed things in his reports, his vitals. Everything started to be change and he said it was very very powerful and I, I understand what he was saying because for me this verse has been so powerful I have when I prayed for people they have said hey where did you get this verse from I said it's Romans 8 verse 11 and they have just held on to um, it so it says you know um, death is at work in our bodies right but the spirit of God is in us gives life to our mortal bodies a body is mortal it is death doomed which means eventually we are going to die but while we are living here on earth because the holy spirit is living in us the holy spirit in me is a spirit of life in me amen the holy spirit in me is the spirit of life in me and god is giving life to my body okay so to my death doomed body god is giving life Okay. And this connects us back to Romans chapter 8, verse 2. It says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yes, sin is producing death, decay, corruption, sickness, more everything else. So while our body uh, is mortal, will die one day, you know, but the Holy Spirit is giving life to our body as long as we're living here on the earth so this scripture is for healing for our physical bodies okay the spirit of life is giving life to my mortal body or is quickening life in my mortal body i like that word quickening the times when things are not changing you know the holy spirit quickens life in my mortal bodies so every single cell in my body is happy every single cell in my body is well, not just because we sing that song with great joy and do all the actions and all that, but because why is my every single cell in my body happy and well? Because the spirit of life is giving life to every single cell in my body. Amen? Amen? Yes. So we need to acknowledge that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the power, dominion of law of sin and death. So you and I should expect that till our dying moments, we want the life to be coming from the Holy Spirit to fill our bodies, to perfect our bodies and to keep every cell in my body well. So we can pray that God, as long as I live today, I want Holy Spirit to fill me with your life, you know, perfect my body, keep every cell in my body well. Well, this is very real and it's a yes because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in me and he is a spirit of life and he gives life to my mortal bodies. Now we can choose to believe it or not, okay? But God quickens my mortal body through his spirit that dwells in me. 
Okay, we'll just take a little side journey and come back. Uh, let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. Can somebody read that, please? 11. 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. Always carry, always carry. carry. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Amen. This is another powerful verse. Notice what Paul is saying. He's saying the life of Jesus is manifested in our earthly body. Okay. In the same passage, he's saying, in the same passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he's saying our outward man is perishing. While this is happening, he's saying at the same time, the life of Jesus is made visible in our mortal bodies. And we must say, Lord, let your life be visible in my body. Amen. So Paul is saying, while we are suffering in our bodies, it can be for various reasons. But he's saying in the midst of that, the life of Jesus is being made visible and manifest. Now, why is Paul writing this? I think he's writing this out of experience. Okay, so let's look at an example in Paul's life in Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 21. Now, Paul is in the, the region of um, Galatia, that is Antioch, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. Lystra, Derby, and Iconium is the places in Galatia. And, you know, Jews from Antioch, they come, and in uh, Iconium, they come to where Paul is, and they stir up the crowd, and they all stone Paul. And it says that Paul was dragged out of the city. That means they have stoned him. He's badly bruised and hurt. And they think that he is dead, so they drag him out of the city. Remember, like, you know, imagine in the in the years of or time of Paul, you know, they wouldn't have had that deep, nicely paved roads and all that. It was uh, it was very, um, there might have been stony, a lot of mud and all of those things, but he was dragged out. And they brought him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. They thought he was dead. But verse 20 says, the disciples gather around him. And you know what happens? <clears throat> he rises up and he walks into the city. Now, if somebody was in that condition, what should have been done to them? They would have bought a stretcher or a sheet and they would have had to carry him, literally carry him into the city. But what does he do? He's left for dead. He's stoned. He's dragged. He's left for dead. And then... He gets up and he walks on his own. Isn't the supernatural? Right? Just imagine if somebody just beats you, you can't even wake up. Right? And the next day, what happens? Paul departs from there to Derby. The very next day. How long it will take for us to overcome this? At least three, four months. Right? Or months together. But he gets up and you know what? He goes to the next city and the next day and does? He preaches the gospel and then he comes back to Lystra, Derby and Antioch where he was persecuted and he's strengthening the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So here Paul is talking from experience. Isn't this a supernatural healing and experience that he had? That is why he's saying we are being delivered up to death for Jesus sake but we bear in the in our body the mark of Jesus Christ but also in those times we have the life of Jesus also manifested in our mortal flesh amen amen so he's saying telling the believers you know hey this is what we need to do we need to just trust in the life of Jesus that flows in and through our bodies okay which means the life of god the spirit of life supernaturally healed him and you know paul is able to stand on his feet and go around and minister and teach the next day so if any of us are in situations circumstances where physically we are weak we're going to sickness frailties declare the life of christ you know speak romans chapter 8 verse 
live it. Amen? Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? Any questions? Any doubts? Okay, if not, uh, we'll stop here. We'll meet tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.